Okay, we're ready. All right, uh, good evening everyone and welcome to our virtual Zoom meeting. It's Thursday, April 15, 2021. Uh, we will now salute and pledge the allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, America and, to and to the republic to which, it, which stands, it stands, one nation under God, under God with liberty and for all. And for all. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, so welcome everybody to our April Community Legislative Committee meeting. Uh, we are so excited to have uh, a lot of students here and also excited to have other individuals who participated in our 2021 Advocacy Day. So just a little bit of history for people who don't know. Um, generally, once a year in the spring, we all pile on a bus and we drive up to Albany. And we have the opportunity to meet with elected officials there and advocate or talk to them about the needs of the BOCES across the state. And we, we train to do that. Um, and the students train to talk to them about like the impact that BOCES has had on their lives. Um, it is a long day, but it's a lot of a lot of fun to do that, to be able to go up to Albany where laws are actually made and where you can see really the center of um, politics in, in New York State. Um, however, because of COVID, we were not able to go up there this year, but we, after getting some information from the staff members, the adults who have been involved with um, advocacy day, especially the ones working with the students. Um, we decided that we would do it virtually. So let me just, can I just, uh, I'm going to pause for a minute. So Bella put something in the chat. Kathy, you're going to try to help her. Okay. Um, anyway, so we decided we would do it virtually. So what that meant is uh, we got adults, the adults who typically are involved to work to train students. And normally when adults prep students to go to Albany, it's not necessarily their students, right? So in this world of social distancing, <laughs> where we've had people pretty locked down with their students and none of this intermixing of classes, this was a little bit of a challenge to, to do all of that and, and get it ready beforehand. Um, really like super, super grateful to Dr. Pat McCabe, who oversees our research and communications department, um, who really spearheaded this with the support of uh, Tracy Seba in my office. Um, but all of that got done, students got prepped. Uh, we had six different advocacy groups, I think six different advocacy groups. Um, and the office worked to set virtual meetings up for those groups with elected officials. Actually, I think we had, we were able to have more meetings with elected officials virtually than we do in person. And it all happened over the course of, um, of one week. So what we have to help you understand a little bit about what the heck does that even look like, um, our communications office also put together about a three minute video which we are going to play right now. So you'll have kind of a visual of what it looked like if you didn't take part. Um, and then we'll give the people who did take part an opportunity to really talk a little bit about what their experience was like. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Paul.
for those of you who didn't take part, um, that's just a little bit of a glimpse of what it looked like. So we had six teams. Um, every team had two or three different sessions with elected officials. And those are, so those are state level elected officials from across our catchment area. So the area in Suffolk County that we represent. Um, we did have some Western Suffolk BOCES um, staff uh, jump into some of our meetings. So we captured some of the elected officials from the Western part of Suffolk County too. And the reason that we focused on advocating with state level officials um, is because the state is the, the level of politics, the level of government in this country that is primarily responsible for education. Right, and in New York State, like in most states, they are definitely responsible for the funding of education. So that's why we speak to them, and not our local officials or our county officials. Um, so I think we have a small enough group. Actually, we have a group that all fits on one Zoom screen, which is ideal when you want to have a conversation. Um, so sometimes when we're in one room, we have people kind of regroup with the groups that they spent time with in Albany. But I think today, because we're small enough, maybe we'll just let you, uh, I'm going to throw out some questions and we'll just let people who took part answer the questions. And let me just pause and say, for those of you who've never been on a legislative committee meeting, I'm Dr. Julie Lutz, um, Chief Operating Officer. And... Um, so, so happy to have you all here. Um, so if you attended, feel free to, maybe I guess what we'll have you do is raise your hand. You can either raise, uh, raise your hand um, visually and we'll see you or raise your hand using the uh, feature in Zoom, which you do by, Or can you raise your hand? The reactions, it's that little smile face down on the right. Okay. So I don't, um, okay. All right, or you just undo your video and raise your hand. So first question, actually it's gonna be two questions in one because the first question is gonna be what elected official did you visit or elected officials did you visit and what was the highlight of any one of your meetings? So anybody who wants to jump in and share, and I know we have students who are just here to listen. So thank you for coming as well. Oh, go ahead, John. Hello, yes. Uh, we met with, uh, I think, set, I believe Senator D. Fistano was his name. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And, um, Senator Fitzpatrick, um, both really, really uh, attentive listening and um, send, uh, no, it's, is it Congressman or Senator Miss Monge? I can't remember, but assembly um, member. he was a lot of fun to talk with. Uh, assembly member, there we go. Thank you. Um, assembly member D. D. Stefano, um, it, it was an awesome time. He was very personable, down to earth guy. Um, he, listened very intently of uh, to our students, uh, gave us um, good points, and hopefully, uh, I believe we were able to make sure he is uh, supporting us. Um, and then Senator Fitzpatrick, I was excited for him because in the past he's been kind of a uh, stick in the mud when it comes to education, and I think we uh, definitely made an impact this time around with the talented uh, group of students that we had talking to him. <laughs> Yes, I think talented groups of students are one thing that he is willing to listen to. So thank you for being part of that. Great. No problem. Anybody else? Go ahead, Lisa. I'll piggyback since I was in John's group. Um, it was a, a good opportunity as we were um, navigating this year with COVID and um, a whole new platform, I think it was uh, provided a lot of learning curves for us, but I also think it provided some really unique opportunities. 
I think um, in the follow-up meeting, everybody had said not only that it was a success, but that we um, got more time with each of the legislators. All of the students got to speak um, for, you know, and be able to share their experiences, which was really fantastic. And it's, um, I know it's not the same as going to Albany, but I think this year still brought a lot of really great points for our students. I think that um, our, our time with the legislators was very effective, even with Assembly Member Fitzpatrick. <laughs> um, no, it was great. It was great. It, it really was. Um, both, both legislators spent well over an hour with our groups. And that was really nice of them because not only did we get to share our experiences, but the, the, both legislators took the time to educate the students about their civic duties, about their different experiences throughout their careers and share all different types of things. And um, this year, I think it turned out to be a really great experience. Yeah, thank you for them. Thank you for, you know, really many years of preparing students to go to Albany and for being willing to really kind of shift the way we did that this year. I know it was extra effort and work on the part of, um, I don't want to say chaperones because it's so much more than being a chaperone. But anyway, thank you for your willingness to do that. Um, and I would definitely agree. Uh, one of the positives was we had longer time with the elected officials. Um, and I think really more focus from them. Sometimes when you're up in Albany, you know, they're pulled in a million different directions and, you know, they have to, um, you know, they're in session. So they get pulled out of their office to go to session. And um, we had very, very little of that. Um, I, I would say most of the meetings were 30 minutes, if not longer, which is um, really um, pretty generous time when you're meeting with a state level a politician, especially in the time that we um, did that, which was February 23rd through 26th, uh, which is when they are really kind of in the, the throes of trying to put together the state budget, which is a really complex task for them. Um, what about other folks? I know other, um, both adults and students, if you're an adult, feel free to share your experience, but certainly students as well. Anybody else who went, who wants to share? I'll share. Go ahead, Steve. The group I was with, we met with Assemblyman Gandalfo, Assemblyman Durso, and Senator Welk. And similar to the other group, I, I think the highlight was very much the, the students sharing their stories and how wonderful it was for all the elected officials to really take the time to listen to them and really understand what, what they were saying. And it was a nice diverse group of students um, in their stories where some of the students were attending career and tech programs because they really wanted to move ahead in their, their careers or college goals. Other students spoke about how both these programs really helped them achieve their education, how they would have not achieve their graduation goals that they are seeing their future if it wasn't for both these programs and their, their career and college goals. So it was really great to see the elected officials take the time to really talk with the students and really seem to support the programs and understand what they do for the kids. Yeah, I would uh, jump on that. I think we had an unusual number of elected officials who had had prior experience with BOCES, either they had attended a career program or their child had attended a career program. You know, the other thing that we take the opportunity to do at these meetings, so the, the students all um, tell their story, right? You know, they train and they practice to really tell their story in about a minute. Um, but we asked the other staff to also just talk about what they do for BOCES because most people don't know all of what BOCES does, right? And the people who go to Albany are people who work in our regional information center or work in our business offices or our transportation offices. So it's another way to help elected officials really understand how complex BOCES is um, and to give just a little opportunity for them to hear about the organization from the people who actually are working in the organization. And what we've recognized since we've been involving students is it gives our staff, those who don't work in our school buildings, a wonderful opportunity to hear 
um, our students' experiences at, at BOCES. I mean, we get that feedback a lot from what I would call our non-instructional staff that, um, that they are really blown away by listening to the students and um, how BOCES has had an impact on them. So I think, Kyle, I think I saw your hand up. Did I see your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, in particular, this session, it was interesting because uh, usually we have a mixture of students from all the differentiating programs that are participating in Advocacy Day. But this time around, I specifically got to work with more students from my program, which I for one always enjoyed and obviously not being able to attend Albany this year was obviously a downer but I still think the students in general enjoyed it because they got to see that they still had in a way and to communicate and a means of communicating especially with those that are connected politically and how that can actually change and alter um, the communities that they're in so they become greater stakeholders within their school specifically Sequoia for us, or realistically, their own communities, their own home districts. So I think it's an enlightening experience. I think it's a good experience and understanding the technological income and outputs is not only going to be beneficial for them in the future, but for us, if we ever have to really come across anything like this in any due time. Yes, definitely. Uh, what about some of the adults? I know we have adults on that took part in it. If you'd like to share, oh, go ahead, Stephen. Uh, yeah, I would um, just in many ways reiterate what was said before about how important the stories the students told were. Uh, and also the fact that it was encouraging that so many of the legislators knew about both these programs, in fact, had participated in them or had relatives who had. Uh, the one point I tried to make when we met with them is the importance of the shared services and the opportunities to save a good deal of money by buying collectively uh, two BOCES programs and on services offered. And I'm not sure they were aware of how what an important piece that is of what BOCES does is provides an, an opportunity for districts to purchase services um, at reduced prices in terms of what they would have to pay on the open market. Yes, that's a really important point. And a, a point that many of them don't, don't necessarily understand. One of the things that we, we didn't say is we have a lot of new, newly elected officials, right? And so what happens is when newly elected state officials start, so they start at the beginning of the year, their year is actually a calendar year, not like a school year. Um, so they've just begun their positions in January. And then beginning at the end of January and through the month of February and March, they are developing a state budget. So they're doing probably one of the hardest parts of their job right when they start their job. Um, so it's a great opportunity to help the, you know, share with them things that they need to understand to make sure that when they're developing that state budget, uh, they're doing it in a way that uh, works well for schools or works well for, you know, whatever it is you're advocating for. So um, it's a tremendous amount of information for them to learn and, and have in order to do that in a way that um, makes sense. But I know there's other students on here who took part. Ava, you wanna share what the highlight of your meetings were? Yeah, I can definitely do that. Um, so joining the Advocacy Day meetings, last year it was very much different than this year, but I'm not gonna say in a bad way. At first I was definitely upset that I wasn't able to go up to Albany and have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. But being able to be on Zoom with them and seeing everyone, and everyone being able to share their story. Sometimes up in Albany, you're not able to share your story to every single one. And on Zoom, you were able to share your story. So they got everyone's impact from all different angles. And I thought that was a really cool piece. And like you said, we got a lot longer time to talk to them. And they were, they almost seemed like more engaged in the conversation and they really cared a lot. And I think that was definitely a cool perspective for this year. 
Nice. Yes. Thank you very much. So the next question, um, describe any special advocacy points or messages that you believe you heard from them, from the elected officials, whether it was agreeing with things that you brought to their attention or new things that you learned as you listened to them. Uh, Leah? Oh, was that a, as an applause, Leah? That's not a hand up, right? Or do you want to speak? I'll jump in. I think, you know, what Ava said and, and Stephen, we met with Alexius uh, Wilk, uh, Michael Derso, and Jared Gandalfo, and they were, these were new assembly people uh, to us. But also, uh, Michael Derso was a, uh, a graduate of Levittown Boses in Carpentry. And they were all pro-education, well-respected uh, of, of, about BOCES. And they all knew something about BOCES, but they were pro-education, which we haven't seen you know, from our assembly people in a while. And especially with the budget being passed, with all the money being taken out for other obstacles, uh, money is being put back into the budget for education for Long Island. Any, anybody else? Um, particular things that you heard, either advocacy points or just things that you heard from them that either um, were news to you or that you just want to share. Go ahead, Lisa. I think a common theme at, at the meetings was that it is a very tough budget year. Um, that was something that was there. And another thing that I think that um, we heard specifically in our meetings because it was shared with them. As Stephen had mentioned, I think that the shared services component, they, that the legislators may not realize just what shared services look like. Like a lot of our legislators that we had met with, the, actually both of them did not realize that um, throughout the pandemic that districts were utilizing the purchasing services available through Eastern Suffolk BOCES. And that was something that they just didn't know was happening because there was so much going on. And um, it was a piece that was really beneficial for our districts, not something you'd think of when you think of um, Eastern Suffolk BOCES. So that was a, a piece that really stuck with me because when we're trying to advocate and we're trying to show the really incredible things that we're doing, of course, we showcase our students and they're really like the, the best work we do. But, um, you know, those are the, you know, also really great things that support our districts that a lot of people just, I didn't know before we started, honestly. So there's that. Yeah, one of the women in um, my group happens to work in our regional information center. And for those of you who are a student and maybe don't know anything beyond the education that you get, um, that particular department of uh, one of their, their priorities really is to provide the technology to um, administrators and students in districts. So as you can imagine, in the spring of 2020, when districts all of a sudden needed devices so that their teachers and their students could begin to learn and, and teach virtually from a distance, there was a tremendous amount of work on the part of that department to help districts and get the devices that they needed to do that. Um, and yeah, most people don't know that, um, that that is one of the services that BOCES offers. And um, so another little bit of, of information. So districts receive BOCES aid. So they receive money back from using BOCES services um, because it's a cooperative service and um, it's cheaper to do things in a cooperative, right? So it's cheaper for one entity to organize all of that for the region. Um, and so districts get an incentive of BOCES aid by using BOCES services. So it's a complex thing and, and things that many elected officials, particularly the new ones, don't necessarily know. So it's a great opportunity to share that with them. Um, other folks who went, any special advocacy points or messages that you believe you heard? So I have to ask if Fitzpatrick wasn't, 
what did you call him, John? A stick in the mud? <laughs> well, what did he have to say? Do you remember? Um, <laughs> uh, it's a little foggy, lots going on since then, but um, he would, he, it felt like he was more receptive this time because I uh, met with him last year as well for advocacy actually up in Albany. And um, last time it was like he, uh, last year, it's like he was listening, but you could obviously tell there was something else on his mind. This time he actually engaged back with us students um, and it was just more attentive. Yeah. Yeah, more attentive, that's the right word, uh, that he was to us. Yeah. So for those of you who don't, um, who don't know him, um, you know, I, I think educators tend to be put off by him because his message typically is, he thinks it's really important that schools um, watch how they spend money and budget efficiently and 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 come up with some cost savings because he thinks that Long Island is an expensive place to live and that taxes are really high. And he's absolutely right. Long Island is an expensive place to live and taxes are really high. Um, but then people disagree on what's the best way to do that. Should Albany just give more money to fund schools or should schools offer less programming for students. So it's not that he's wrong in the fact that Long Island is an expensive place to live and taxes are high. It's just um, that people have different opinions as to how to how to fix that challenging problem. Um, did whoever meet with um, Steve Engelbright, did he talk about, um, usually he's, he's very interested in things like solar power or wind power. That is his passion. Okay, so this is the last question. Are there any recommendations you have or things that could have been done differently to improve the Advocacy Week experience? Go ahead, Jim. Um, I think at least for this year being how it was kind of um, not exactly last minute, but a little bit more difficult on how we normally do it. Because in the past years, it's kind of been the same mold, same kind of kind of system. We leave the buses at this time. We get to Albany at this time. We have the meeting at this time that's how it usually goes with the set schedule and it just changes little by little from year to year this year it was a huge change so i think as successful as it was for the time that we had to prepare and obviously with the conditions of covid and all the restrictions that we had i think we did pretty good i don't see much as of right now given our circumstance that we could have done better this year, but there's always something to improve, but that's just my opinion on it. I think we just did really good this year. Yeah. I, I appreciate that feedback. I would agree with you. I think for, it was a heavy lift to shift from, you would think that going to Albany would be a heavier lift than setting up meetings, but there was a lot of, of shifting to learn how to do it in a different way and to set that up. And um, you are absolutely, absolutely correct. I will say of the three meetings that my group had, every single student made it to every single meeting on time. And these meetings were really throughout the school day and they weren't doing them from their classrooms, right? So they had to get to a spot in the building where there was a computer that they could have and kind of a private space so that there wasn't auditory interference. 
Um, it was really amazing. And, and I know that building administrators who were not necessarily part of an advocacy day also had a lot of work to do to make sure that, you know, those messages were communicated to students and that technology and spaces for that to happen were set up. So it was really an all hands on deck um, year. And I, I couldn't agree with you more, John. I think, you know, everything considered um, really uh, an A plus for how it, uh, how it rolled out. Um, Stephen. Yeah, the only thing I would add is a number of people spoke about some of the positives that this new format provided and more opportunity for students to talk um, and more time to interact with the legislators. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would just wonder if there might be ways to incorporate some of that if and when we go back to a more traditional model mm -hmm. in-person interactions with the legislators to try to take advantage of some of the things we've learned from the Zoom learning that had advantageous features. Yeah, I think those are that's a really good thought. Do you have any anything specific in mind when you say that? Well, I would I would um, emphasize student involvement, and uh, we've all talked about how important the student presentations and discussions and stories are. And I think when you do it in person, the meeting is truncated. So uh, I, maybe you need to lead with the students to always have them start. And then the adults can finish at the end with any things that points that weren't covered. Um, that might, might be one way to do that. Yeah. You know, as you're saying that, one of the things that I realized is we actually were able to have more student involvement because um, generally the spaces on the bus dictate how many students are able to take part. And because we didn't have to worry about spaces on the bus, um, really are the only thing that um, kind of defined how many individuals is we wanted to make sure that every meeting didn't have any more than 25 people, including the elected officials, so that we didn't have people on a spillover screen that wouldn't be able to be seen. But, you know, considering the fact that we had six groups, um, we had many more spaces for students. Um, and in the three meetings that my group was involved in, I think at least two of the meetings, um, every student had the opportunity to share their story. Because in the first meeting, you know, we didn't think we would have time for that, but it really truly becomes, um, I think, the most impactful part of the meeting is for the elected officials to hear from from students. So um, yeah, I think that's a really good point to schedule the meetings in person in a way that the students speak first, I guess is what I hear you saying, Stephen, right? Mm -hmm. All right. I would and like give to every student a chance to talk that way. Yeah. yeah. Bill? Yes, maybe during the course of the year, we can uh, use in the virtual meeting Zoom uh, with the students before we go up to Albany so that they have an introduction to who we may speak with. You know, pick out an assemblyman or a senator, uh, introduce, the, introduce the students to him or herself. Before, you know, we, we meet, we have the legislative breakfast in February. And by the end of February, we're going up to Albany. And maybe we can start something at the beginning of the school year, say in November or December try to put that face in front of them. Uh, in an actual Zoom meeting, you mean? Yes, yeah. Maybe we can do something during the course of the day. The students are in school. Yeah, one of, um, go ahead, Lisa. I was going to kind of piggyback off that. Um, having the group meeting with our whole group, like once we knew who was in our groups, having the virtual group meeting was so beneficial this year. Um, I think that normally because of the way the day is structured and the fact that we get started at such a bright and cheery hour of the morning, um, it, it doesn't leave a lot of time for us to sit as a group and let the um, adults and the staff that are there that may not know the students in their group get the time to sit with them and vice versa. And the first time we really all get to you know, have that trial run is in the first office where we kind of get our, our groove going. With this setup, we were able to meet um, as a whole group, get to know one, each, one, one another, and then also 
say, okay, this is how we're going to line up our meeting. And we actually, in our group, created an order of the students um, for them to speak. So there wasn't this lag time where we're like, okay, who wants to go next? No, we knew exactly walking in, the students were able to say like, I want to go first or please don't put me first. Um, and it all kind of flowed very naturally. Um, I'd like to take the chat function with us. That was a huge tool <laughs> that I really enjoyed because it allowed um, us to speak as a group um, because we could kind of message each other privately during the meeting. Um, and that was a really nice thing because we could all stay on the same page and help guide our, our um, talk. And then lastly, uh, a takeaway, uh, headphones. I would do that next year, didn't think of it this year. We were all in the same room and we had to turn up one computer really loud. So, um, you know, we were spaced out six feet so that we were okay, but um, it was like, turn one computer on. We should have used headphones. Mm. How simple would that have been? <laughs> so yeah, those are, you know what, those are great learnings um, actually. I think at least three or four of the students in my group were in audio booths out at War Tech in the, you know, so, but <laughs> we had to explain to the elected officials, no, we don't have them in closets, right? Those, those are actually audio booths so that they don't have, have sound, uh, kind of sound interference. But, you know, one of the things I'll be honest that school leaders are now beginning to talk about and, and the case at BOCES as well is, you know, what of platforms like Zoom do we want to continue with? Because there are definitely some <clears> benefits. <throat> and, you know, what I just heard you say, Lisa, I think is a great benefit, right? Is, you know, you can in a 30 or 45 minute Zoom meeting with people all over the agency, you know, with a group that's spread out all over the agency, be able to have a planning meeting um, much easier than trying to get people to drive someplace or trying to get staff to go where it is that students are. So that's a great idea. And I would agree, um, having those planning meetings was helpful. Um, I, you know, so the priorities that we take to Albany change a little bit every year. So those planning meetings are also a way to talk a little bit about priorities and for the group members to kind of meet each other. Um, and I think for the students to get a little bit more comfortable with the adults that are in the group. But who else, people who went I'd have a suggestion as to how it could be done differently to improve it. Ava or Kyle or anyone else who went. I mean, I don't really think, I think this, this one was just a point of circumstance. And um, as it was stated earlier, I don't think it's a terrible idea maybe to utilize um, online meetings, maybe to get the students more acquainted to the groups. But at the same point, it's it's kind of a cool part of the experience, being able to just meet all the new people, having that sensation of going up to Albany. Um, so for I'm quite like mixed, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I, I enjoyed this experience. Um, the students in our group enjoyed the experience. Um, I know in the future, the students that who have the opportunity to go to Albany will also probably enjoy the experience just as much as those that have in the past. So at this point, I think we'll, the best option for us, it's not really a suggestion, is just to see what the horizon actually has for us and go on from there and allow the circumstances of the time determine exactly what we're going to do. I mean, this just showed how adaptable as an agency we are to complete a task that we wanted to complete. And um, I, I, along with uh, uh, my group, it's all the groups and Dr. McCabe, um, you, Dr. Lutz, and everybody else that participates in this needs to be appreciated and uh, pat on the back for the work that's been put in. But I appreciate that, and I'll pass that along to Dr. McCabe, who I don't think could be here tonight. Any, so let me just, any questions from anybody who wasn't part of Advocacy Day, whether you're a student and you want to know a little bit more about it, or an adult who didn't go and you have any questions for the students or the people who did go? Um, 
Um, I can definitely say something about that. I think that um, I was in your group and I think that you being able to guide us through the meeting was definitely very beneficial because when, especially when you're in your first meeting, you're so scared and you almost like rethink your like whole entire speech in your head. And you're not so worried about your speech. You're worried that you might mess up or you might fumble on some words and just having you direct us in the right area where we needed to go. Like you'd be like, okay, it's Ava's turn. And then you'd go to the next person. It was, it was very helpful. So you weren't like, should I unmute my mic or should I not at this time? And you weren't having like 18 different people trying to start their conversation at once. So I think that was, that was definitely good. Yeah, that is definitely good feedback too. And I'm assuming that happened in every group is that there's somebody who kind of took control of, of the meeting to guide it. Um, and Ava did an amazing job. She was mm -hmm. our kind of intro person in addition to telling her story and she's got a great story to tell. So really appreciative of her being willing to do that. Um, any other questions, comments, thoughts of people who didn't go, who want to be able to hear from somebody who did go, what it was like or anything else you might wanna know. A hard time seeing hands on these screens. Um, all right, so I'm gonna give you a couple minutes to think about that. I wanna just give you a little summary of what happened with the state budget for those of you who are not up to your neck in state aid to schools and legislative um, budgets. So the state did pass a budget, wasn't on April 1st, which is their deadline, but shortly after, probably within a week of that. Um, and school districts in the state got more money from more state aid for schools than we have seen in probably a decade, right? There are, there are school districts that are working really, really hard to figure out how to spend that money. That is how much money came. So one of the things, um, so let me just say, there is a, an aid called foundation aid, which is just what it sounds like, right? It's this foundational aid that districts get from the state. And it has been underfunded for many years. And this, uh, this year, the state passed a budget that says over the course of this year and the next two years, they will uh, fully fund foundation aid. So again, district, and the way foundation aid works is more of it goes to high needs districts or districts with low wealth. Um, because it, it was developed that way. It was developed to go to the districts that need it the most because the districts that have high wealth don't need as much foundation aid. So a ton of money has come to public education. Um, I think it's really a testament to the work that groups like this did to let elected officials know how hard schools are working in the middle of a pandemic to provide education, how certain districts need more money than others because of the needs of the students and the needs of the districts. Um, one of the other things that had been proposed was that they pretty much do away with BOCES aid um, and a lot of other different kind of specific aids, categorical aids, um, and they, um, they did not pass that either. So BOCES aid still exists as a separate and distinct aid, which is very, very helpful for programs like the ones we offer, particularly programs like career and technical education. So we're really um, thankful for that. Um, some of that is because the state has more revenue or more income. So they have more money than they anticipated they would have, right? So there was a lot of forecasting that because of COVID and all of the businesses that have been shut down, um, that the state wouldn't have the revenue it needed to pay its bills, but the revenues are higher than they anticipated, which is a good sign. Um, the other thing that they've done is they passed a tax, what they call a millionaire's tax. So they're going to tax very, very wealthy people um, more money, more tax than they have in the past. And that will bring in extra money to pay some of what they have committed to providing to places like public schools. 
They also, some other things that we would not necessarily agree with, but passed, um, they have legalized marijuana um, and not necessarily because they approve of marijuana, but because it is um, income producing, right? So they're going to get um, a lot of money from the sale of marijuana. And there's all sorts of, of really kind of strict guidelines as to what that needs to look like and um, strict guidelines as to where that money needs to go. Like some of that money needs to go to educate um, young people on the dangers of, of marijuana. So it was a complicated budget. I think the fact that we have a democratic governor and a democratic um, Senate and a democratic assembly. So all three of the decision-making bodies were of the same party uh, was probably helpful. We've learned in this committee that um, it's easier to get a bill passed if you are in the uh, majority party and all three of, of the decision-making entities when it comes to the state budget are democratic. So um, lots got done in this budget that has not been able to get done in the past. So um, really good news for the districts that we serve um, and for their ability to provide programs like the ones at BOCES for the students that attend there. So. Um, which is such good news because districts really were um, worrying about being able to put together a budget for next year that um, was going to provide the programs that they want to provide for the students. And that timing wise, that's what districts are doing, right? They're putting together their budgets. They're having their presenting them to their communities. Um, many districts have had their budgets approved, you know, this week so that they can um, put them up for a vote in May and um, get the approval of their, of their districts. So any last, um, Edward, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do. So about the uh, millionaire's tax, is that just a state thing or is that a national tax? Um, that is a state thing. So this was a state budget. I'm not saying that there's um, there may be different kinds of taxing of millionaires from the federal government, but this is a um, this was a state budget, so it is a New York state tax on millionaires, and it's it's not just people who have one million. Um, it's like people who have I don't I don't remember the different categories, but if you're a 25 million, your tax goes up this amount. If you have 50 million, um, so there's there's different levels of that. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, Stephen. Uh, yeah, uh, you may have covered this, I wasn't sure, but what about the services aid? Um, did that yeah, not- so, that Yes, thank you. So what the governor, so just, just logistic wise, what happens is in January, the governor proposes his budget. And then between the end of January and April 1st, um, the other two houses propose their budget, and then they all work together to come up with the budget that is eventually passed in the beginning of April. One of the things the governor uh, proposed was to do away what they call with what they call categorical aids. So things like aid um, for transportation of students, aid for BOCES programs for students. Um, and a number of different, I think there are about 11 different separate aid categories. And he said, you know what, just roll them all into one, it's simpler. Um, he also then of course decided he would take a certain percentage of money off of the aid, so he wasn't going to fully fund them. Um, the problem is it's much better for a district to actually get the aid. So the way aid works is a district um, pays out the money. So let's say a district sends a student to career in tech ed, they get aid on that the next year, right? So it makes sense for them to actually get aid on the money that they've spent because they can budget for that. They can plan for that, right? Um, but that was, um, that was not approved. So special services aid wasn't approved. All of the aids remain as they were proposed. The other thing that happened is a tremendous amount of federal money came to the state. Some of that came in December um, in the way of the corona, 
Coronavirus CARES Act, and some of that came um, this year, I don't know, March, I think. Um, so outgoing President Trump um, passed, uh, passed a, a proposal to send money to schools and states. And uh, now President Biden also spent, um, it's called the American Rescue Act, I think. Um, so that, that also helped is that districts got a tremendous amount of money um, and a good amount of that money uh, purposefully was to help districts kind of get up out of the hole that, of the money that they've spent to deal with COVID. So Julie, go ahead, Em. I just had a question um, relative to all this, you know, wonderful news about um, our increases. Is that going to affect the cap in future years? Is that going to loosen the concept of the cap on property taxes relative to, or is it too soon to have any? No. So the, the, the law that says that um, districts have to stay under a particular tax levy cap, that's law and it was made permanent uh, a couple of years ago. Um, the way this might impact the cap was if, if districts decided that they would um, tax their taxpayers less and use some of the money that they've gotten um, to fund their budget. Um, the one caution about that is your next year's tax levy builds on this year's tax levy. So if districts go out with a tax levy cap of zero, um, they never, you know, they, the next year they build on where they start. So they never really kind of regain that money. But there are districts that's the big conversation over the last couple of days. Um, there are some districts that are choosing to use some of that money to offset their taxpayers um, and um, changing their budgets because many budgets had already been developed, but changing their budgets um, and using some of that money to, to fund uh, the, what taxpayers would otherwise pay for. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, any other questions or comments before we close? Because we're closing in on eight o'clock. All right, so let me just say thank you again to everybody who made this happen. Thank you to the folks who showed up to listen about it. Um, we have one more meeting for this year. Bill, I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Our next meeting will be May 6th, Thursday at 7 p.m. We have guest speaker, Assemblyman uh, Phil Ramos, who represents District 6 in the Brentwood area. Yes, and Phil Ramos is great to listen to. So I encourage you all to come back. I know some of you actually went and visited uh, with him or actually didn't go, but visited with him during advocacy week. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. All right, everybody, all right. enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you again. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Yeah. You too.